Thank you, members. Okay, we move on now to questions to the Minister for Education. Topical question number seven, standing in the name of Mr. Jerry Kelly, has been withdrawn, and there are no grouped questions in this session. So I call Mr. Andy Allen. Mr. Question, Allen. Question number one, Deputy Speaker. Minister. Uh, thank the member for his question. Uh, I'm interpreting this as the number of referrals to the Education Authority for a statutory assessment. Uh, where a statutory assessment re may result in a statement or may not uh, may note in lieu of a statement. Uh, the latest figures we have, as of the 28th of February of 2020, 2,081 children are undergoing a statutory assessment. I call Mr. Allen for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for his answer. And at the outset, I'd like to declare an interest as uh, I have a relative currently going through the process. Um, Minister, um, from that engagement from uh, parents whose children are involved in the special educational needs assessment process, they are indicating to me the communication between them and the Educational Authority has been somewhat abysmal. Will the Minister give a guarantee or not to, to take an undertaking to review how the Education Authority communicates with parents to keep them updated in respect of the assessments? Well, as the member, member is probably aware, there was a wider review has been done by way of an internal audit um, by uh, Education Authority. That produced an internal audit report, I think, would be by common parties fairly, fairly damning uh, and resulted in a range of um, recommendations. Uh, obviously, first of all, as the Department will be ensuring that uh, there is proper delivery of, of those, and I think there will need to be a, a clear-cut role for the Department, at least while it's up to EA to deliver. Uh, I think at the heart of that, um, there has been considerable problems in terms of communication. I think that's some of the areas that we do need to uh, improve upon. And I suppose prior to being in post, I too would have experienced difficulties, I think, particularly as regards communications on SEN with the EA. Uh, obviously, it will be a subject that, in terms of some of the detail, I will be going into greater detail um, of the Education Committee. I think I am due to appear in front of them uh, on Wednesday week. Call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, does the Minister agree that the findings of the audit of the SEN, EA SEN assessment and support process uh, for children with special educational needs demonstrates a systemic failure of children with special educational needs, and does he agree that nothing less than an independent review of the EA is now necessary? I want to consider the best way going forward. I think, uh, in terms of the review, I think it was, a, as I said, a very damning report. Uh, the, I suppose the only point I would make in relation mentions about a, a full independent assessment. There were concerns, and I think. Um, understandably, people had a concern whenever the EA launched their internal audit that there was suspicion that this would be some sort of whitewash job, that there would not be a, a proper investigation into that. It is fairly clear, reading the full report, that they have gone into this uh, both thoroughly and also with a critical eye. I think what is particularly important is that both the recommendations are put in place, but also as part of that report, it also lists a range of immediate actions. Now, while ultimately it's for the EA to implement those, uh, I'll be looking at ways in which the department can have a direct role in ensuring that, um, that the EA is held to account uh, with those. And we'll have to monitor as, as time goes on. I think we have to be given some opportunity to correct, I think, many of the mistakes that, that have been made and show that there has been uh, clear improvement. I call Ms Karen Mullen. Last can uh, Minister Furler to the Chair of the Education Committee's question there, the answer you have given. And further to the EA internal audit report presented to the Committee last week, can I ask what action your Department is going to take to ensure that there is no repeat of these failings identified and to special education needs? Well, look, we will be, we'll be working alongside the Education Authority. I think if there is a report, they have got to be given some level of opportunity to implement that. But they can't simply be left, I think, to their own devices. We need to make sure uh, there is a duty of care, I think, for all of us to try to ensure that the most vulnerable in our society, and particularly as regards to children's special education needs, are actually properly served. I think the report showed a catalogue of uh, problems, a catalogue of mistakes. There are direct recommendations that arise from it, and it's about ensuring that, that those are then brought to fruition. And there's a key role, I think, for the Department in trying to ensure, and working alongside the EA, to make sure those are put into effect. Again, uh, I'm sure this will be dealt with in greater depth next week. Call Mr. Sean Lynch. Question two. Okay. okay. 
Um, the Peace 4 programme currently provides funding for shared education partnerships within Northern Ireland, uh, the border counties of the Republic of Ireland, and on a cross-border basis. There are two projects that are, funding, are funded, collaboration through sharing in education for primary, post-primary and special schools. This project has a budget of €28.9 million, Euros, uh, plus uh, up to a further €2 million Euros, uh, to provide for additional support for shared education partnerships. And also then a second um, project, sharing from the start for early year settings. Uh, it has a budget from the EU of €4.26 uh, million. Euros. The funding will continue um, until the end of the 2021 uh, academic year, i.e. it will, is guaranteed, if you like, up until June 2022. Uh, the programme does not stipulate amounts of funding to be spent on partnerships within each jurisdiction uh, and cross-border. So funding is allocated annually to the successful applicant partnerships over each of the, uh, of the five years of the programme. And the partnerships, therefore, can include um, arrangements between schools that are entirely within Northern Ireland, schools that are entirely within um, the Republic of Ireland, provided, the, again, they fall into those border counties, uh, and also uh, projects on a north-south basis. Call Mr Lynch. And the Minister will no doubt agree that these relationships and cross-border programmes through the shared education are highly valuable. Does the Minister intend to maintain this level of funding in the context of uh, existing the Gurmarkit? Well, obviously uh, we're waiting to see precisely what the shape of arrangements are in a post-Brexit situation. There's already been indications, um, I think, from the EU indeed especially EU programmes, but they would like to see this continuing. I suppose really the, the question to some extent is how will these be funded uh, post the, the Peace 4 programme. Uh, as indicated, obviously, this will be ending in 2022. However, uh, a new cross-border Peace Plus programme has been announced for the 2021 to 27 period. Uh, and that's obviously a successor to both Peace 4 and Interreg. Uh, and will be funded jointly, and I think there's been acceptance of this by both the EU and the UK government. Uh, the SEUPB is currently leading a development of that programme from input from the government, both North and South, and other stakeholders. So, if you like, we are at the moment in a process of co-designing uh, a programme, and the Department of Education is currently engaging with officials with what are effectively our opposite numbers in the Department of Education and Skills as part of this process. And a range of the proposals, I think, are currently under consideration for possible inclusion in the programme. Uh, and that would include, for instance, the shared education for schools, the early years and uh, youth, and include a cross-border element to that. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to ask the Minister to further on from uh, on the shared education and integrated ed education by saying how much has been spent um, through the uh, Fresh Start budget, how much is in planning to be spent, and how much is left over, please. There won't be any money left over, certainly if, if we secure which has been indicated in the New Deal uh, new approach from uh, the, uh, you know, there's been a guarantee of flexibility and obviously we've got to hollow that out precisely with Treasury. So the aim would be to actually spend all 500 million uh, that would be there. Uh, and indeed we have projects that are designed to uh, ensure that that money is fully realised. Part of the complication I think arose in terms of the spend to date uh, has been the initial parameters that were essentially put around the programme by Treasury were that it could only be, had to be entirely from a fresh call, so that any projects that were pre-announced um, were not able then to be funded. It had to be a full capital programme, and the money could only be spent at the time it was spent. That is meant with, with any major capital programme. If you're talking about a full, full school build, you're going to have virtually none of that in the first year. It will probably take a few years to, to, um, and that, I think, led to a level of frustration. It was an issue which um, successfully, under the confidence and supply arrangements, was then negotiated uh, to change that, because particularly the end-year flexibility would have created the danger of money being, being lost, particularly in early years. Um, I think there is still a little bit of work to tie that down in terms of the New Deal uh, new approach, gave indications that there was still a silly commitment in the government to ensure that flexibility. We're still scoping out just all the details of that, working with our colleagues at the Department of Finance, uh, because the nature of capital bill, whenever it's ring-fenced to particular projects, will be at times a certain uneven spread. 
So in the first few years, there'll be a number of the years in which there wasn't able to be spent the full 50 million. Indeed, initially, there'd be very little that was able to be spent. But in some of the subsequent years um, that we're facing, there will be much more than 50 million will be needed in a particular year. We ought to make sure that, that every penny of that is, is delivered. Uh, and that's why I think in a range of projects uh, going ahead, we have enough projects, we believe, to actually be able to fill, fill that. There's always the opportunity for an additional call if there was uh, need uh, to absorb any additional money, but we believe in terms of the profiling there won't be anything particularly to spend. We've effectively probably slightly overcommitted to ensure then that if there are any problems, uh, that uh, that can at least mean that the full amount will be spent. Gently remind the Minister, two minutes. Uh, you can have an additional one if you ask for it. Uh, Mr <laughs> George Robinson. Three, Mr Deputy, Principal Deputy Speaker. Suitably chastised uh, <laughs> in relation to that on it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, can I say, in exceptional circumstances which are entirely outside of control of the school, schools can apply to the department for a reduction in the number of days they are required to operate, known as exceptional closure. Guidance for schools is contained in the department's circular uh, number 2019-13, including details of the online application process developed by departments to assist schools in this process. On receipt of an application, the department will decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether an exceptional closure uh, should be granted. Uh, I should emphasise that whilst the situation regarding um, the coronavirus is changing very quickly, uh, current public health agency um, advice is that schools should remain open unless in a particular case there is direction to close. However, as, as time moves on, the position as regards exceptional, we are living, if you like, in a fairly exceptional circumstance and therefore uh, there will be cognizance taken of that within any decision and therefore uh, we'll look at each individual case, and it may well be, as I said, events move on in such a way that there will be a, a particular change in, um, in approach in terms of the exceptional closure side of it. Mr George Robinson, for a supplementary. Thank the Minister. Can the Minister outline what steps he has taken to keep schools and parents informed of, of developments? Well, we've written out, I mean, part of the thing is obviously to ensure that they get the correct advice, they get it from a single source. So on the 27th of September, I personally wrote out to all principals and education sector partners, including the link to the PHA website, because it's important that as regards school hygiene and the health advice that that comes directly from PHA. Uh, that is being updated as the situation develops, and we've emphasised the importance of monitoring the website regularly. Uh, it is also the case that, um, in terms of particularly travel advice, uh, again, the source of that is largely the Common, uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, and arising out of that, Again, we've notified schools in, uh, as soon as is practical once there is a change. And so, for instance, uh, on Sunday evening, there was a different approach taken by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in Northern Italy. That was notified out to people um, before lunchtime yesterday. Uh, again, last night, positions have changed again in terms of Italy as a whole. So, again, people have been notified in, in relation to this. Including in the email, I suppose, to the, uh, to the schools, um, there is the updated chief medical officer advice, and indeed I know a number of schools have also taken advantage of the opportunity, particularly on a conference call with the chief medical officer and public health agency. So my department continues to communicate with our education sector, um, issuing communication, issuing the links uh, and the self-isolation advice leaflet to the education sector, and I've also made sure that the PHA website link has been prominently displayed on the DA website. And obviously. Given the health implications of this, there is close cooperation between my department, the Department of Health, and also liaisons with um, other um, education departments um, throughout these jurisdictions. Several members have indicated they wish to ask supplementaries. Mindful of Mr Speaker's ruling at the start of the week, I will not be able to get to everyone, so please bear with me and forgive me if I do not get to you. But Mr Colm Gildenew is the first on his feet. And I'd just like to thank the Minister for the work he has been doing and the work his department and indeed teachers and school and staff have been doing at this difficult enough time. But what are the circumstances in relation to this outbreak that would require school closures? Well, again, we would be very much driven by, um, uh, driven by the medical advice, and sometimes that will be because of the potential threat to uh, students. Um, in the case where it has happened, um, on a temporary basis, it is, uh, there is not any indication of community transmission. Indeed, at the moment within Northern Ireland, the health advice that we have is that all the cases in Northern Ireland 
Um, none of them have actually come by way of community transmission. So I want to reassure, first of all, parents uh, in that particular case that there is no direct threat uh, to their children. I think that is important to, to state. Um, the exceptional closures can be, for example, on the basis of the current situation where it is felt on the advice of the public health agency that it is important to have a deep clean of the school. And so in the Newton Hamilton case, uh, for both the school affected and the adjoining school, um, the high school and the, the primary, uh, the advice of the public health agency was to close until the end of this week to allow a deep clean. They are not testing, I think, any of the, uh, any of the pupils. And we will follow, in terms of that exceptional closure advice or indeed other advice, uh, what is being advised by the public health agency. It is important that it is a health driver. Um, but as things move on, um, I suspect circumstances may move on as well. I call Mrs Sinead Bradley. Speaker, and I appreciate the Minister's words of reassurance. Um, I think that is important. The Minister be aware the Education Authority does have access to a very rich bank of very good supply teachers. But in the event of staff in the school, non-teaching staff, are there any backup systems in place to make sure the operations of schools can continue? Well, I think the member makes a couple of points. Obviously, there is a bank of supply teachers. Uh, we will look and see if there is any flexibility in terms of non-teaching staff that is required. And provide support for that. Uh, there will also, I suppose, reach a point um, where we will need to look and, depending upon uh, how far things have spread, how, how wide, there is also the opportunity through EA and through C2K for opportunities for remote learning as well. So we want to have a full gamut of, of, of opportunities. Uh, that is why it is particularly significant. I know the government uh, centrally is putting through legislation uh, which will give, if you like, a, a range of powers to government departments. Those are powers which I am sure a lot of us hope do not have to be exercised, but certainly from the Department of Education and indeed other departments in Northern Ireland, we have asked for the maximum amount of powers so that we are not caught on the hop, we are not created in a situation in which uh, we have to react to a particular situation and then find uh, that we do not have the power to do that. So we will adapt um, our actions depending upon the circumstances and again following that expert advice. Call Ms. Paula Bradshaw. My question has been answered. Thank you. Call Ms. Pam Cameron. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Would the Minister agree with me that it is vitally important that uh, either teachers, pupils, or parents uh, that are concerned about the coronavirus, that if they have concerns, that the first port of call should be the 111 number, with uh, the, selecting the first option of one? Uh, once they get through to that for Northern Ireland um, helpline, and that indeed, if they are symptomatic, that they should actually ring their own GP or their out of hours GP in order to get uh, advice from them. And indeed, if need be, that GP can then refer them to the pod for testing. Well, I am tempted to say, in light of the um, earlier remonstration from the, the Principal Deputy Chair, the answer could be yes to that. But um, yes. to elaborate a little bit further, no, I think it is important that people follow the correct advice that they go through the particular, uh, through the NHS, for instance, the helpline, uh, which is there to be able to provide that information, um, and that also people behave responsibly. There, there is a particular level of advice if anybody has suspicions that they are infected in terms of both self-isolation and contacting their, their GP. It, you know, it does not help that if somebody has a concern that they suddenly rush into hospital in an A&E department, because that risks the opportunity for community transfer. And, and at the moment, we are still in the containment phase. Uh, at some point, we may move into the delay phase. But all the experts will say the more that this is contained, the more that it is delayed, the better opportunities it, it gives for hospitals to be able to deal with it, for people actually to find um, solutions to this problem. Um, and I think that that is the responsible route for everyone, um, irrespective of whether they are a pupil, a teacher, or um, a parent. Call Mr. Roy Beggs. Number four. Uh, during my visit to Carrick Fergus Academy, I was able to hear firsthand some of the difficulties that the, show, uh, that the school had encountered, having to operate on a split site following the amalgamation of Carrick Fergus College and Downshire School. Uh, I can confirm that an application was submitted by the Education Authority on behalf of, of Carrick Fergus Academy under the recent call for major capital projects, uh, which closed on the 31st of October 2019. As this is still a, a live process, it would not be appropriate for me to comment further on a new build for Carrick Academy at this time. 
I do hope, however, to be in a position to make a major capital announcement of scheme to advance in planning in the next couple of months. Uh, the school continues to avail, in the meantime, of minor improvement works, uh, another strand of the, which is another strand of the capital investment strategy. In the last few years, in the region of about 74,000 has been spent on minor works across the junior and senior campus sites. 16 minor work applications were submitted by the school under the last minor works call in October 2017, and eight of, of those applications are currently being um, assessed, uh, which approved progress would uh, have an additional investment for the school. Call Mr. Beggs for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for, for his answer and indeed for, for coming to the to Carrick Fergus Academy. Um, but would he accept that there is a need for an early uh, concept layout for a new school, a new plan in the area, uh, given that, that there are road safety improvements that are required to the entrance, potential investments, and indeed other uh, investments such as a, a 2G pitch? So there's a good layout which will stand not only for the short term but for any long term investment in this site. Well, I have this. I, I appreciate it. Obviously, there are restrictions on what I can say. I think the member has made his point uh, well in connection with that. Uh, clearly, there are a range of schools that, know that are very deserving of that level of capital investment, and that will be part of the, the process. I mean, I was also struck at the meeting. I think one of the things that will also need to be, uh, in a broader sense, examined, obviously, while this was focusing on the capital requirements, um, I appreciate very much that schools that operate under a degree of split sites then face particular additional resource difficulties. And I think it's important as we move ahead in any examination of common funding formula to see that, that are those being properly addressed, notwithstanding the overall problem that there's not enough money within the system as a whole. Um, so the problems that some of the pressures that are faced by, uh, by Carrick Fergus Academy are, in that sense, not unique to Carrick Fergus Academy. We've seen it happen with other amalgamated sites. And I think that's something we need to bear in mind, both in terms of what resources can be put in place and I think it will also be something that, um, that everyone will need to be cognizant of as we look into area planning in terms of split site solutions. I think, generally speaking, they can only really be a particular short to medium term solution. It can't be a long term solution. I call Mr. David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers today, along with uh, thanking him for his visit to Carrick Academy in recent weeks. Uh, also acknowledge the money that has been made available also to uh, keep the school taken over in the meantime through minor works. But when does the Minister intend to, to make an announcement on potentially Carrick Academy? Uh, well, as I said, it will be in the next, uh, I suspect it will be in the next, um, we're expecting a major capital assessment and announcement then within about the next two months or so. So um, the successful schools will, will learn at that particular point. Obviously, that was a process that was started pre-devolution. I should say as well, in the meantime, there is an opportunity then, as mentioned, although, for instance, Carrick, because it's in the major works programme and if successful, would not be eligible, for instance, for a school enhancement programme, that doesn't preclude minor works ongoing. I know there's a number of those in track. Um, as indicated, some of those have taken place and others will, will happen. So where particularly there's a health and safety issue, that will always be a, try to be addressed in the immediacy, even if a particular school is ending up being successful within a major capital works programme. Call Mr. Cattle Boylan. Could I thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister. But would, would the Minister consider prioritising investment in some of those schools who are operating out of temporary uh, port cabins? Well, as regards I suppose, both the school enhancement programme um, and also the major capital works. There is a, an independent scoring mechanism which scores depending on the application. Obviously, the state of the buildings, whether it is a split site, whether it's helping area planning, um, whether, for instance, in terms of the state of the buildings, the levels of temporary accommodation, all those, are, amongst others, are a range of factors which are taken to, um, uh, to be able to score those. Now, as the member will appreciate, we take, for instance, the uh, school enhancement programme as one example. Um, so far, I think there's, there's been around about 60 or so of those have been successful. Uh, that's out of an initial application of 165 applications. So uh, there's got to be something which is fair between schools, because in many ways, in terms of limited resources, schools are competing with each other. Uh, you know, I would say, at least in terms of temporary classrooms, that is not the ideal situation. Uh, however, what I would say, and I know a number of schools have been facilitated at times with temporary, uh, temporary classrooms. Uh, the old sort of porta cabins that 
uh, whenever I was at school and maybe even in the, uh, the distant days whenever Mr Boylan was at school um, and the, the visions of, of those are very different to the type of temporary classrooms that we, ha we have today but all those factors are taken into account when any assessment is done on the relative needs of particular schools. Call Mr Philip McGorgan. Kesh Deborah Coog, question five. Um, I should clarify that in relation to uh, this issue um, that the uh, responsibility for each it's responsibility for each employing authority to monitor and man manage their workforce, uh, and that includes the Irish medium sector. Uh, an employing authority can be the education authority, CCMS, or the Board of Governors in individual schools, depending upon its management type. Uh, I met in February with the representatives, with, sorry, with the Irish medium uh, representatives uh, body. Uh, CNG that my department funds. So I'm aware of the concerns of the sector in terms of teacher supply, particularly at a post-primary level, where subject um, special, uh, specialists with appropriate Irish language and pedagogical skills uh, in immersion education are being sought. My officials have been conducting a series of meetings with the Irish medium sector, with uh, initial teacher education uh, providers to understand the issues um, and the range of potential solutions. Uh, clearly, in terms of teacher education, it is something that goes beyond simply the Department of, of Education. Uh, and so there will also be discussions that have been taking place with the Department for the Economy in relation to um, initial teacher education provision uh, from its perspective, because it is the Department of Economy would, would fund that. Um, I expect a series of options reflecting potential short-term and longer-term solutions to be developed uh, for consideration. And at this stage, I can't preempt what outcomes those will be, not least given the potential for the resource implications which we need to be factored in. Call Mr McGregor. Gary Melgood, last count caller. The Minister will be aware of the growing nature of uh, Irish medium education, with more and more pupils across the north accessing their education through Irish. And uh, you know, given the, the growth in the sector and given the increasing demand within the sector, particularly uh, the growing number of children accessing their primary education through Irish, uh, does the minister agree that uh, increased, a significant increased investment is required for Irish medium post-primary uh, education, uh, including a strategy, a workforce strategy? Well, I think in terms of the workforce strategy, as I said, we'll be engaging with CNG to see what what is best fit for purpose, because uh, part of the issue as well is what are the longer term solutions and what are the short term solutions, because even if there is a change in terms of the mix of teachers coming through initial teacher education, somebody starting in St Mary's, for instance, uh, in September will not be a fully qualified teacher for a number of years. That won't necessarily meet, uh, and there can be other demands of different sectors, that won't necessarily meet a fairly um, Sort of quick demand. So I think we need to look as well at what other measures can be taken in place and whether that uh, can be at times the, uh, the issue of, and I know there has been uh, sort of a language upskilling of existing teachers at times is one route in connection with that. Uh, I suppose another examination could be what particular skills are there within the broader teacher workforce at present. So it's about trying to make sure that, that every child gets what is needed for their education on that basis, which as I said, there are options getting developed. It's got to be obviously in conjunction with the, the sector to try to make sure what is put forward is fit for purpose. Mr. Okay, um, the Minister said that if and when options come before him, he will consider them in the context of the resource implications. In considering the resource implications, will they reflect on the figures which I quoted this morning in the debate, which he supplied in answer to questions, which indicate that the Irish medium sector already per child is receiving 8% more than the allocations within the controlled sector and 6% more than the allocations within the maintained sector and already has a preference in terms of the level of funding per child. Well, I will take all issues into account. In terms of initial teacher education, particularly in terms of resource implications, will be most acute for the Department of the Economy because in terms of teacher training, it is not something which, uh, while there is a role from the Department of Education in terms of setting numbers, effectively as the Department of Economy picks up the tab, there will be, I think, some variations between sectors. Uh, in part, that will actually be that those figures 
will vary to a large extent from school to school. So smaller schools, to which I think some of the Irish medium schools will tend to be a higher proportion of them, will tend to be more expensive per pupil uh, than uh, other schools. And that applies, actually, I think, throughout the sector. So while the figures are there in terms of uh, the difference, it's not an even picture actually going from school to school on that basis. But obviously, we've got to try to ensure that all our children are catered for in an equitable manner to be able to provide um, the, the best education that possibly, possibly can. I have about 30 seconds, so if Ms Kelly would like to put her question, the Minister will answer, but there's no time for a supplementary. Kesh Deverishay, question six, please. Right. I, fully, I remain fully committed to delivering the Educationally and Strategic uh, Significant Programme. It represents a major capital investment in the West and Northern Ireland, stimulating uh, further development and regeneration of the region. The next stage of construction has been delayed due to tendering issues and the need for business case uh, reapproval. My department has completed a fundamental review of the construction programme and I am giving this urgent consideration. At this stage, uh, provisional opening of the campus is planned for September 2024 at the earliest. This will depend upon works commencing uh, by May 2021. The investment to date has delivered the design, construction and fit out of Arvali, uh, the Strathroy Link Road to improve traffic. from. Uh, to and from the campus and the extensive site preparation. It's also delivered designs for the core schools. In terms of non-construction project, work continues on the delivery of a range of shared education initiatives which are being developed and led by the schools themselves. This will ensure that today's pupils will have the opportunity to enjoy the benefits of sharing and play an important role in shaping future education delivery both locally and regionally. While the uh, procurement competition is, is currently suspended, uh, it remains live and as a result it would be inappropriate to comment further on the procurement process at this time. I think that's called speed reading. Well done. Um, we now move on to topical questions. So I call Mr. Andy Allen. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister to provide an update on area planning and, more specifically, the proposals uh, pertaining to the restructuring of special educational needs schools in Belfast? Well, I think at this stage the uh, area planning is continuing. I think there is a concern that across the board that uh, the overall speed and pace of area planning um, has not perhaps uh, moved as quickly as it should do. I know that there's a wider situation because the, the aim will be, which sometimes can create a little delay in and of itself, broadly speaking in area planning, to try to get all the um, sectors moving in a sort of a more coherent, joined up approach. Getting them, if you like, aligned is, is not always easy. I know that's a particular issue in Belfast. Um, I think, obviously, the member will have been aware in terms of the special needs situation in Belfast, there were proposals, um, they were felt, I think certainly by the EA then, there was a considerable level of public representation in relation to that, that what was put forward wasn't fit for purpose, and they were effectively withdrawn at that, at that stage. Um, I think at this stage there's nothing further has come forward for the EA, uh, so initially I suppose as the managing authority it's up to them to give consideration to uh, where that is. Obviously, part of this is we want to ensure that, particularly for our special needs pupils, that we have something that is absolutely fit for purpose. And it was in Belfast, the configuration uh, grew up over a number of years. It was a slightly haphazard way. So we need to do that while recognising, obviously, the sensitivities um, and ensuring that the people are not detached from schools that they have had very strong connections with. Call Mr Allen for a supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, um, I, and I'm glad to hear your commitment around special educational needs schools being fit for purpose. Uh, and off the back of that, I've had a number of parents contact me in relation to the lack of communication again from the EA in respect of this. Will the Minister give a commitment or a guarantee that the EA will directly communicate with uh, parents of children currently attending special educational needs schools to listen to their concerns further and engage them in the wider process? Critical. Obviously, um, I have a little bit of restriction on what I can say uh, because ultimately this may lead to development proposals to which I would have to give a sort of a legal verdict. But it's clear, I think, from the previous process um, that while I think a lot of the thinking uh, in terms of previous proposals um, was very well intended and very virtuous, I think there was a clear problem in, in, around communication, around a level of disengagement. I, I think it's clear, while nobody will ever want particularly to be keen to see a particular school closed, um, notwithstanding I think the remarks of Mr O'Dowd uh, earlier on today. Um, the position is that I think that the more that, in terms of developing a plan, that uh, the EA and the, anybody putting forward a proposal can bring a consensus with them and bring parents alongside them. And I think early communication, before it reaches the stage of 
uh, a formal development proposal, I think, is, is critical, particularly in the issue of special educational needs. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, as the Minister would be aware, we have more and more children um, uh, who are, uh, attempt mainstream schools with complex medical conditions. Now, I know that there is a pathway in place when it comes to diabetes. Can the Minister um, please tell us what process uh, is in place when, de when dealing with other complex medical interventions? Well, I know it is certainly an issue. The Joint uh, Department of Health and Education Policy document supporting pupils with medication needs provides a robust framework for enabling all children with medication needs to access the necessary support. All schools have access to this guidance and funding was allocated to EA to provide training to all school principals on how to meet uh, the needs of pupils with uh, medical needs. Um, school principals are responsible for determining the training needs of their teachers and school staff and they um, can avail of the, of the wide range of, of courses on as all aspects of special educational needs, including diabetes, offered by the, the EA. Um, Training with regard to health conditions, including complex medical conditions, would also be provided by the relevant health and social care trusts and will be in line with the pupils' individual health care plan and subject to an ongoing review. Can I also say I am aware of the issues being raised in terms of mainstream schools. I am also acutely aware, having visited a special needs school um, last week, that there are concerns at times within those schools as to whether or not the appropriate medical backup is there for particularly children with complex needs. Um, I think also the importance of special educational needs have given uh, a direction uh, that in terms of training days, uh, that the advice to schools that, that, that of the special sort of five training days, that at least one should be directly allocated to special educational needs training. Obviously, this, is, this goes beyond that into a more specialist um, position. Thomas Bradley for a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? Um, I, I know in reality that that is not always the case in how things are working out within our mainstream schools, and I know that we are seeing an increase in medical intervention being required. It's just that I, I know that also that there has to be referrals made, and I just want the Minister to assure us that the school uh, get the, the assistance that they require not to disenfranchise these children with complex medical needs. No, I, look, I think that's, that's very important. Um, and I suppose at times, I think one of the things which is quite helpful um, has been there's been a problem, particularly in terms of definition of special educational needs, that medical needs in some ways have been lumped in alongside that. Um, and sometimes that can mean that uh, the person with um, medical needs has very significant educational needs, um, is uh, the most obvious person that should be, uh, should be given assistance and statemented within special educational needs. On other occasions, there can be a strong medical need, which actually doesn't lead to particularly an educational need. To be fair, I think in terms of now the way, and this is the first year I think this has happened, in terms of the uh, school census and the categorisation, there has been a separation out from those who have very specific special educational needs with those who have direct medical needs, and that, which will help a level of identification. Um, obviously, uh, there will be, if you like, some level of, of support that's given by be it a diabetic nurse or an epileptic nurse specialist. Uh, but advice and guidance, I think, is available both to the Education Authority and the School Health Service. I think what we need to ensure, again, with Children's Cooperation Act, there has been at times very good work that has gone on, particularly at departmental level and at a higher level. Uh, I think what we need to ensure, therefore, is that the practice then permeates throughout the system so that practitioners at the, at the lowest levels are also in that joined up approach to ensure then that particularly the medical needs of, of pupils are taken fully into account. I call Mr. Patsy McLone. Excuse me. Um, could, could I ask the Minister, will he consider taking a personal decision himself to ban all trips by schools overseas? The short answer is no. And the, the reason why I'm doing that is. It should not be my opinion. It should not be the Department of Education's opinion on that. And indeed, we may reach a point where going five miles down the road may be more dangerous than going to a foreign country. We just don't know how this is going to develop. I will be entirely driven by the expert advice that is there from uh, one half the health authorities in terms of what actions need to be taken within schools, and also in terms of travel, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office have the expertise to be able to give that advice. My advice to schools is to uh, to follow that, and you know, I think that that is the safest way. If I try to put in what I personally think or what the department thinks, 
which may be either a reinterpretation of that expert advice or indeed, worse still, differing advice, then I think we're in danger of sending mixed messages out to school. We're in danger of giving the wrong information. And I think that that would be highly irresponsible and dangerous. Um, could I ask if the Minister is aware of research by Professor Mark Handley at University College London, who compared the rates of or coronavirus infection in Italy, which is in crisis, to that in UK, Germany, France, Spain, US, Switzerland, and found they are growing at the same rates. So, um, again, if I could ask the Minister what advice he is guided by, if he is aware of this uh, specialist research, and indeed if it is wise for people to send their kids to hotspots of coronavirus outbreaks? Well, again, with respect on it, yes, I have seen different pieces of advice that, that have been uh, publicised in different, uh, different views. It is important that we do not get a, sort of a range or gamut of advice coming out, because particularly those who are doing sometimes particular elements of research are not always on the same page, do not always come to the same conclusion. It is important and the most responsible thing is, first of all, as regards travel, that there is a single source of information, which is the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, who gather together all the pieces of advice and advise that. Um, and as regards the local health, the public health agency, now we will be working closely together as an executive. That will mean potentially escalation of, of advice, escalation of information and action that needs to be taken. But if if I pick and choose which academic piece of research I base my views on and the advice on, I think that that is the wrong approach to take. I think we need to have something which is focused in on a single clear piece of advice that is unambiguous and a single source of advice. And I think that that is the, not only the best way forward, it is the only sensible approach that, that can be taken. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister if his department has any process to assist encouraging or obtaining a regional balance of schools selected for the Educational Battlefields project? Well, the Battlefield project, which is something that has been ongoing in different parts of the UK for a number of years, um, is directly from an Northern Ireland perspective administered by the Education Authority on behalf of the department. Uh, so the way it works out is that each post primary school in Northern Ireland is invited to nominate two, tenure, uh, two year 10 pupils and one teacher to take part in a study visit. Each study visit is made up of pupils and teachers from a wide cross-section of post-primary uh, schools. Where possible priority is given to students who would not normally be able to avail of such an opportunity. Schools from across Northern Ireland and across all sectors uh, and school types have participated in the visits. And it's gratifying to note that, that one of the byproducts of this has not only been a a shared understanding of our shared uh, history, but also a deepening of good relations and promotion of mutual understanding, which have been cited as positive, um, positive outcomes for participants. Obviously, in terms of the timing, given current events, while the EA, I think, will be liaising with schools, uh, I suspect that, that in terms of time frame, people will want to see how things develop before there's any commitment in terms of time frame to any particular uh, visits. Thank you, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. Would the Minister agree with me that youth projects which focus on our shared history, such as the Schools Battlefield Scheme, can be of great benefit in helping to grow understanding, respect and tolerance amongst young people from all sides of the community in Northern Ireland? Well, it can be. As I said, in terms of, I think, all school sectors have taken part in this. There's been a wide range of schools. Um, and it has, if you like, both an educational uh, impact and, indeed, given the fact that while we're in an area of tight budgets, there's been a relatively low cost uh, to this. Um, it has been both an, in, an invaluable educational experience, but actually very specifically, given a lot of the feedback, has actually also been valued by the, the pupils and teachers who have taken part in terms of creating a level of mutual understanding, a greater level of respect and uh, tolerance and friendship indeed between uh, the various schools and the various pupils. I think that is some of the intangibles which flow from a, a project such as this. Minister, exam time is not too far away. Uh, in, in the event of the inevitable spread of the uh, coronavirus, um, what contingency plans, what emergency plans have you in place um, in order for our students to be able to sit their GCSEs and their A-levels? 
at the moment, we're working on getting detailed advice from CCEA. Uh, they're working with the exam regulators because, obviously, in terms of exams, um, and I should point out as well that, that while CCEA, for instance, are the, both the, the regulator of exams, they're also the supplier of the vast bulk of the exams, but the market in Northern Ireland is also open to um, exam bodies from outside of Northern Ireland. So it's important that we get, if you like, a consistent approach. Uh, that, I think, is then sort of worked through by CCA with the broad exam regulators which look after all the exams across the United Kingdom. So there is ongoing work at present by CCA with the exam regulator to try and scope out precisely the contingency plans which potentially could be put in place. At present, there is no cancellation of exams. And so at present, we're working on the, an initial assumption that exams will simply go ahead. However, that might be overtaken by events, and we will have contingency plans uh, put in place. But some of the detail of that is still to be worked out by CCA because it doesn't lie entirely within CCA or indeed the department's hands. Uh, has the Minister given consideration for uh, setting exams remotely, and are you investing further in C2K in order for that uh, to be possible? My understanding is that both in terms of remote learning and therefore potentially the opportunity for remote examinations, that what is in place from the EA, from C2K, would actually enable that to happen at present. So I'm not sure if there is some level of additional uh, resources required that can be looked at and I think can be prioritised. But there is, if you like, the, the basis both for remote learning and therefore remote exams that potentially could be there. As I said, we will scope out with CCA and the exam regulators what the best way to take this forward. And where we are today in March may not be the position that we're in the beginning of April, beginning of May, beginning of June. So to some extent, there will be a range of scenarios that will be, that will be worked through uh, by the department. And in terms of any discussions that we're having within the department directly around contingency plans, we'll be having CCCA at the table throughout those so that that particular aspect can be front and central, because it's probably the most, uh, as, along with potentially school closures, it's probably the most obvious area which might be impacted by the coronavirus. Thank you, members. Uh, that concludes questions to the Minister for Education. The Assembly could take its ease for a few moments. The next item on the agenda is questions to the Minister for Finance. Thank you.